All right, and the rush hour is on. New York beefing up security at airports and bridges and tunnels and mass transit systems in the wake of today's terror attack in the New York City subway system. Now, it is not just a concern for the Big Apple, but pretty much across the country. Any major transit hub, whether in a big locale or not, all this as we're learning a lot more about the suspected bomber. He darn near pulled it off. Eric Sean in New York with the very, very latest. Eric. Yeah, Neil, the suspect reports say was inspired by the ISIS calls to commit terrorist attacks during the Christmas holidays. That he was walking in that subway corridor when he saw a holiday poster, and that set him off, they say, to explode his device. And that the suspect is identified as a 25-year-old formerly licensed livery cab driver from Brooklyn who originally came to this country from Bangladesh. His name is Akayed Ula. He arrived here in the United States seven years ago on a so-called chain immigration visa. That is the type of visa that President Trump wants to end because it allows family members to enter this country. A photo of Ula shows him curled up and crumpled right after the bomb went off. He has suffered burns on his arms and stomach from the pipe bomb that was attached to his body through Velcro and zip ties. Three passersby also wounded. The brother of one woman says she was left temporarily deaf and disoriented. Take a look at the shocking video of the moment of the explosion. It shows the smoke and the haze. Police call the device unsophisticated and small. They say Ula made it in the electronics store, uh, the shop that he works at. New York City Police Commissioner James O'Neill. He had burns and wounds to his body. Preliminary investigation at the scene indicates this male was wearing an improvised, low-tech explosive device attached to his body. He intentionally detonated that device. The police and the FBI later searched his home in the Flatlands neighborhood of Brooklyn and that of his parents nearby. Uh, there were reports that Ula has admitted making the bomb, that he followed ISIS videos on the Internet and tutorials on bomb making uh, from radical Islamic sites in order to pull this off. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio says the New York City subway is the lifeblood of this city and it strikes at the very heart of New York. Let's be clear, as New Yorkers, our lives revolve around the subways. When we hear of an attack in the subway, it's incredibly unsettling. And let's be also clear, this was an attempted terrorist attack. Thank God the perpetrator did not achieve his ultimate goals. Well, in 2010, just blocks from here in Times Square, there was another attempted terrorist attack that also fizzled, uh, thankfully. Uh, by the way, Ula is expected to face federal terrorism charges in federal court. Ironically, the very same federal courthouse where just six weeks ago, terrorist suspect Saifullo Saipov appeared. Saipov, as you may recall, is charged with carrying out that ISIS, also ISIS-inspired terrorist attack on the bike lane by driving that Home Depot pickup truck, killing eight people. Neil, back to you. Eric, Sean, thank you very much, my friend. So what are investigators going to be focusing on right now? Let's ask former FBI Assistant Director Ron Hosko. Uh, Ron, uh, what do you think? Well, Neil, I think they'll be starting with uh, people in the links of that chain migration that uh, Eric mentioned. Uh, that's a starting point. They uh, certainly will be conducting a detailed search of his house, of his social media, of his social network phone contacts of, of our holdings, our intelligence community holdings of contacts overseas to see what the other three-letter agencies may have about this person. Um, you know, very disturbing and very concerning that someone of this nature, even this low-tech uh, of a device, gets into the heart of Manhattan and is able to explode it. You know, it's interesting. Um, he just bungled it, but he didn't, he, he, you know, he, he could have done a lot of damage. So I know authorities are, you know, rightfully bring the sigh of relief and pass along that this has been stopped. But there, but by the grace of God, and just a couple of turns of events, um, it would have been a very different outcome. Yeah, very true. Even a crudely crafted device that may have not detonated as he intended, um, typically terrorists are looking to load these things up with shrapnel. And when you're talking about detonating something uh, that has significant power in a confined space with a lot of people present, I mean, really, in, in ways, the ideal target and certainly ideal for as a terrorist target in New York City, um, the notion that just he came out 
principally injured and, and not too much for everybody else is really almost miraculous. Um, what do you think in terms of help that he might have had? Neil, there's no telling, but uh, here it looks like he was not a, uh, a, a particularly good uh, craftsman at design, and it could be this was the first de device that he built. Certainly law enforcement will be, will be looking for evidence that he built others and may have taken them someplace, a range or out into the woods somewhere to detonate them, but it looks like he wasn't a particularly good craftsman. And as I said, um, you know, these, these devices can turn deadly on the builder. Uh, we saw that with a skilled bomb builder, R Ramsey Youssef, uh, a few decades ago, who had a, a fire and a detonation prematurely and, and injured him. So these things can go off if it's black powder as the, as the explosive. Those, those things are sensitive to pressure and friction. And, and so it looks like he wasn't very rehearsed, probably didn't have a lot of help. It sounds like radicalized or learned on the Internet. That's a good thing for other people that were in this uh, subway uh, tunnel today. When they talk about radicalized on the Internet, and I know I hear that a great deal, Ron, I pestered you with this same theme when sadly we do, you know, get together to talk about these attacks. Uh, it, it, does that mean that he's radicalized on his own? And who's radicalizing him? Is, what, is he reading stuff on the Internet and he just becomes more and more aggressive? What? Yeah, it could be a combination of things, Neil. There are certainly videos that are available although some of the tech firms are doing better and better at pulling those sorts of graphic, uh, terror-inspired videos down as soon as they are identified. But there, there are online magazines uh, that are terror magazines that you can locate pieces of or potentially the, the whole magazine. You can learn and, be, uh, and read about hate, read about the destruction, read about the ideology, and, and it can be a combination of that. It can certainly be people in the neighborhood, uh, people that are associated yeah. with him, and, and certainly the Internet is a feeder and a driver of these things today. Ron, thank you. As always, your expertise comes in handy. Uh, Ron Hosko, the former FBI assistant director. Now, this is the second time in as many months that we've seen attacks targeted the Big Apple, the attack in a subway passage near Times Square today, and, of course, the truck attack in lower Manhattan on Halloween. New York Governor uh, Cuomo saying uh, this morning that the reality is New York is indeed a target, always will be. This is New York. Uh, the reality is that we are a target by many who would like to make a statement against democracy, against freedom. We have the Statue of Liberty in our harbor, and that makes us an international target. Last time I had the pleasure of uh, speaking to Tara Mahler, she was echoing that theme, uh, that like it or not, uh, cities like this one and, and many others are targets for those who wish us ill, former CIA analyst Tara Mahler. Uh, here we go again, Tara. I mean, this, this could have been a whole lot worse, but it is a reminder that bad guys sort of like, uh, you know, going after big cities, the Big Apple chief among them, huh? Absolutely. This is concerning, but it's not surprising. This attack it shouldn't be surprising for a number of reasons. Number one, New York City. That's always been on the terrorist watch list in terms of targets. Number two, transportation hubs. We saw this happen sort of in the crossroads of the Times Square area and Port Authority underground, a known type of target for terrorists. Number three, ISIS has lost territory and has been calling for these types of attacks, and we've seen this over the past year. And I guess also number four, the fact that there was an online, what seems to be at least from the initial reports, an online element to this, that the individual probably was not at least no evidence yet part of a larger coordinated team or with really high level training but probably came across this material online in some way or contacted with terrorists or their materials online so all four of those show why this is again concerning but not surprising you know tara um, obviously we had enough intelligence to determine that there was chatter noise about something in new york something at christmas time something during the holidays uh, so we knew enough uh, about an intention, um, but it's hard to go from there, right? Because A, it's a big city, B, there's a lot of chatter, right? 
Right. So obviously around the holiday time, we always see these sort of general strategic warnings. I believe the State Department, before its current worldwide travel alert, had a holiday alert out about a month or so ago. And they traditionally do this. We saw last year in Germany the Christmas market bombing. You've seen more increased perimeters down here in Washington. I just drove past the Christmas market barricaded outside because these are areas of concern. But again, that's a strategic warning. That's not a tactical warning in terms of a specific intelligence on a specific time or a place. You have millions of people in the morning commuting in New York City. It's very difficult unless an individual is on a watch list or unless there are signs that authorities can pick up on and lead up to an attack. But I will say that, uh, your, you know, the previous guest mentioned, a lot of this content, while the tech companies have taken down some of it, a lot of it remains online, and, and that's the next battlefield here. I mean, our organization, Counter Extremism Project, has been trying to pressure companies to get this radicalization material off the Internet. Um, YouTube recently took down Anwar al Waki videos, which have been instrumental in many of these radicalization cases. But there's still a wide range of materials out there for actors to latch onto and to instruct them and radicalize them from the comfort of their own home or on their iPhone. Scary. Very, very scary. Tara Muller, thank you very much. A former CIA analyst. Thank you. Would uh, Donald Trump's immigration plan, where he was going to call for what some said extreme vetting, have changed any of this after this? If his policy had been in place, um, then that attacker would not have been allowed to come in the country. Well, the White House uh, not wasting any time uh, calling for immigration reform in the wake of today's New York terror attack. Could anything it would have done in those prior crackdowns on illegal immigrants and regular immigrants being sort of siphoned through the system here have changed what happened? Fox News Channel's Kevin Cork from the White House right now. Hey, Kev. Hey there, Neil. You're right about this. Listen, the White House once again renewing its call for an interchain migration. This in the wake of the news that the alleged perpetrator of today's bombing in the city benefited from exactly that. Now, let me just sort of explain this for the folks at home who don't sort of follow the inside baseball terminology. Chain migration, it's a process that allows immigrants to sponsor the migration of extended family members. You know, a mom, a dad, a grandparent, cousins, etc. The 27-year-old in custody following today's attack is from Bangladesh, has lived in the U.S. since 2011, and according to the Department of Homeland Security, you got it, benefited from precisely the type of chain migration that President Trump and several key Republican lawmakers hope to end. Is the president concerned that there is a growing threat against people inspired by ISIS who have been radicalized online? I think that the president is certainly concerned uh, that Congress, particularly Democrats, have failed to take action uh, in some places where we feel we could have prevented this. Specifically, the president's policy has called for an end to chain migration, and if that had been in place, that would have prevented this individual from coming to the United States. So the president is aggressively going to continue to push forth uh, responsible immigration reform, and ending chain migration would certainly be a part of that process. Wasting no time and getting right to it. By the way, a recent Fox News report found that more than 70 percent of immigrants from 2005 to 2015 benefited from chain migration, thus the push by the White House to curb the practice. I should also point this out. I think this you'll find this interesting, Neil, for context. About 140,000 nationals from Bangladesh have immigrated to this country between 2005 and 2015, and for perspective, that's almost equal to the entire, the entire population of the city of Syracuse, New York. A lot of people, and thus a great deal of attention from the White House moving forward. Neil? All right, that's amazing stuff. All right, thanks, buddy, very, very much. Well, the suspect mm -hmm. was, as uh, Kevin pointed out here, technically, legally, so does he have legal rights. Former D.C. police detective, defense attorney Ted Williams. Ted, what do you think? Well, uh, good afternoon, Neil. Um, the problem is, yes, he does have uh, legal rights. He's co closed in the Constitution by just by the virtue of being here in the United States. I heard uh, Senator Lindsey Graham earlier this morning uh, asking that this guy be treated as an enemy combatant. And I got to tell you, I agree with uh, Senator Graham, and my rationale for that agreement is simply this. When someone uh, commits a terrorist act where they are trying to kill us in this country, I think that the intelligence community should have the first dibs at that person to try to get all of the information that they can prior to them lawyering up 
and having constitutional safeguards. You know, I do worry about the lowering up part because they're quiet up to that point, right? I mean, there's a, there's a, a brief period which you might have a shot at, at getting something from them. Do you suspect that, that authorities have or, or no? Well, you know, in this instance here, it seemed as though that this guy was very talkative and has given the authority quite a bit of information. But again, uh, that's probably f on his, uh, on voluntarily, and prior to him uh, speaking to a lawyer, because if he came to me uh, and, and they advised him of his Miranda rights, I would tell him to shut up and not say anything if I was going to be his lawyer. So again, that, that's a, a catch-22 in this country right now. Um, Ted, uh, switching gears a little bit, do you think he had help? You know, it's hard to say at this time because he was such an amateur about the manner in which he made this bomb, the way he carried this bomb, and uh, the manner in which it uh, appeared to have exploded. But I can tell you, Neil, that that is certainly something that the authorities are clearly following up on at this stage in the investigation. What happens when these sort of things happen? I mean, we, we, it, I, I, I often say it's more than coincidental that every time we get a re report uh, that ISIS is on the run or in trouble in Iraq, it's getting shoved out of Iraq, getting shoved out of Syria, getting shoved out of all these other countries, that lo and behold, a lone wolf inspired by ISIS or radicalized uh, uh, by and to ISIS pulls off something like that. That can't be accidental. It can't be accidental, and it is not accidental. These guys are able to use social media sites, and uh, ISIS and these other groups are able to know how to influence individuals who are here already in the United States and how to radicalize them here to do the harm that they do. So it, it, they're, it's, Neil, it's sort of like a needle in the haystack. Uh, it, you, we, we can't get at all of these guys. We, uh, the, the intelligence community clearly have some of these guys on the radar screen, but it's very difficult uh, to get at somebody who radicalized and who wakes up some morning and say, I'm going to make a bomb and I'm going to go out and kill Americans. Yeah, amazing, amazing, amazing. Ted Williams, thank you very, very much. Um, by the way, back to politics now. We're just getting word that uh, basketball great Charles Barkley, uh, an Ober, uh, Auburn basketball legend in his own right as well, will be campaigning for Doug Jones, a Democratic candidate in Alabama tonight. Uh, so obviously the pressure and the big names are on uh, as they make the closing argument to Alabama voters with the big election tomorrow. More after this. All right, down to the final hours right now in that Alabama Senate campaign. Republican Roy Moore, Democrat Doug Jones, trying to get a last big boost from some big names in their respective parties. Fox Business Network's Hillary Vaughn in Midland City, Alabama, with the latest. Hey, Hillary. Hey, Neil. Well, the Secretary of State of Alabama tells me they've never seen an election like this before, but they expect about 20 percent of voters to hit the polls tomorrow. So phones across Alabama are ringing with big names in both parties sending out robocalls. Former President Barack Obama, former Vice President Joe Biden, President Donald Trump all getting calls out to rally their support for both parties. So uh, the latest Fox News poll, though, shows Jones 10 points ahead of Moore. So stakes are really high for Moore tonight night as he faces his conservative base for a final time before polls open tomorrow. He's holding a drain the swamp rally at the barn behind me here in Midland City. He's going to have a full bench of conservative firebrands behind him, including Steve Bannon. A source tells Fox News that one of the surprise guests here tonight will be Sheriff David Clark. And a source close to Bannon tells me what their strategy is here tonight, writing, quote, Steve and the gang will lay out the case of why Doug Jones is a radical leftist Democrat trying to take down President Trump. Democrat Jones and his pack of lunatic leftists like Cory Booker are trying to desperately invade Alabama to push Trump out of office. office. Now, Jones today jumping on unconfirmed reports that Moore was out of the state over the weekend attending the Army-Navy game. Of course, that hasn't been confirmed, but Jones nevertheless taking the opportunity to attack his opponent. Roy Moore was not even in the state of Alabama over this weekend. Y'all have covered politics for a long time. When is the last time you've heard of a candidate for a statewide office leave the state? 
Now, Moore didn't have any public campaign events over the weekend, but while Jones is getting more face time with voters, Moore is saying that Jones is pretending to be a candidate that he is not. I think he's viciously attacking me because he knows his values, his, his uh, standards are not what the Alabama people uh, find dear to them. Uh, he is basically painting himself as a moderate uh, when, in fact, he's a very liberal Democrat. Now, Neil, there is still a chance that some conservative voters here could choose to write in a candidate instead of backing more if they're still not sold that he's the right guy for the job. We talked to many Republican voters throughout the state as we went on our road trip around town over the weekend, and a lot of people said they still hadn't made their mind up yet. Neil. All right, Hillary Vaughn, thank you very, very much. All right, uh, that's why these polls can be all over the map, but one stood out, a Fox News poll today that has Doug Jones leading Republican Roy Moore by, by 10 points to pollster Frank Luntz. Frank, always good to have you. Well, these thank polls, you. I don't think I've ever seen such disparity uh, in polls, sometimes coming out the very same day. What's going on? I've told people don't pay attention to them because you really don't know what's going to happen. At a 20, let's say that you're right, that there's a 20% turnout. Who turns out determines who wins. I don't see the same kind of excitement in the African-American community, which will be somewhere between 95 and 97 percent for Doug Jones. I do see tremendous excitement with conservatives trying to, to, to state a message in favor of more and against the Democrats and the elitists in Washington, D.C. That said, I can't call it, and I've never been afraid to call an election up to this point, wow. because I don't know the makeup of that actual electorate tomorrow. It's, it's about jazzing your base, I guess. So, hence, you get reports that Charles Barkley, the basketball great, will be there on, on Jones' behalf tonight. We know the president has been robocalling on behalf of uh, Roy Moore. Do, do these sort of outside players, big and as important as they are, all the way up to the president of the United States, and Barkley, of course, in the case of Jones, do they move the needle? Can they bring out the vote? I don't believe that Barkley will, although he's very well respected in the state for his commentary and for his athletic prowess. I think that, and I had a chance to talk to more voters down there, and you can see it on YouTube if you type in my name. In listening to what the voters had to say, their priority was sending someone who would not undermine the Trump agenda. Alabama is one of Donald Trump's strongest states. And the objective also was to send someone who they believed was a true conservative who is prepared to fight for conservative values. There's a tremendous amount of aggression. Neil, it's, it's outright passion, and there's anger against both sides. And I got to wonder how long it's going to take for the state to heal itself after this election, because it really is torn itself apart. Um, the big issue for Democrats is that they quietly hope that more wins because that would always be an albatross around the neck of Republicans. What do you make of that? Nobody, I mean nobody ever hopes to lose an election no matter what they say. That's just political posturing. The Democrats want to send a message across the bow and let's face it, if you elect a Democratic senator in Alabama, that's going to scare the heck out of people in Washington, D.C. Conversely, if you elect uh, Judge Moore, you're going to have weeks and even months of controversy right here in Washington. Does he get seated? What kind of investigations happen? And it's one of the reasons why voters are paying more attention to this election than any off-year special election that I can remember in modern times. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody's emotional about it. Nobody wants to hear from the other side. And so that division that, that I speak of in Alabama is taking place all across America. Yeah, a microcosm of what we've seen already. Um, thank you very much, my friend. Frank Luntz, pollster extraordinaire. Luntz Global, type in his name. You see a lot of schmutty pants stuff. All right, by the way, uh, that election is so important. It, it could move markets as well. It has a lot to do with the makeup of the United States Senate, which is why on Fox Business, beginning at 8 p.m. Eastern time, we are on it. As long as it takes, when the polls close and when we have the final results, we are there. But here is the added Betty that we have. We have instant market and financial reaction around the globe. So that's like getting the best of general news and the best of business news, all combined, all for you. More after this. We are closing in, and they got to get home rush hour in New York City and a lot of other eastern cities now. The big concern after today's just missed attack, what does it mean? Back in 60. 
They say timing is everything. So when uh, in line of the terror attack or planned one in New York City, Iraqi Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi declaring victory against ISIS in its territory over the weekend. Uh, no one uh, really disputes the fact that ISIS nationally is losing ground as fast as losing influence. The thing is, it doesn't stop attacks or loan attacks. Uh, in fact, they accelerate. That, that is not just a coincidence. Hudson Institute Middle East analyst Michael Pregent with us now. Michael, what do you make of that? That's an uncanny thing I've noticed at least, that no sooner are we, you know, high-fiving uh, having ISIS on the run, which we should. It's a, it's a great victory, as it is for Iraqi soldiers. Uh, but then they try to prove that there's still a merit and, and, and danger by orchestrating or at least galvanizing these attacks, right? Exactly. We've seen from the onset that any time ISIS lost territory, they compensated with a spectacular attack, spectacular attack, or, or some sort of a Quentin Tarantino execution video. Hmm. And now we're seeing them taking credit for uh, people like uh, Ula here, who, who used it, uses an unsophisticated weapon, uh, has a, a failed attack in regards to actually producing casualties, and they're looking to take credit for anything. They built a brand to take credit for anything. How influential are they at radicalizing, though? Let's say in the case of, uh, uh, of the assailant in New York today, if he had no help or it looked clumsily executed, as it, as it clearly did, um, that he might have, you know, you know, stumbled out the gate, but there are plenty of others waiting at the gate to do the same, right? Well, they're hoping there are plenty of others waiting uh, to do the same. What they do is they inundate the web, they inundate these jihadist sites with, uh, with re recommendations on how to conduct an, an attack or actual uh, training on how to conduct an attack. And so then they hope actually somebody spell bites. it out, right? Like in a city right. and a train, how you go about doing it. I've seen it spelled out almost to, to the tape. Right, and they, they hope somebody bites. Yeah. Now, this is a case where ISIS is, is grasping at straws, uh, claiming responsibility for, for this attack. Uh, again, a, a failed attack when it comes to a uh, terrorist attack, an improvised explosive device. Uh, there was no shrapnel, there was a premature detonation, and he's still alive. So we should be able to get valuable information out of him as well. You know, uh, with ISIS on the run, a lot of times they morph into a new entity. It's just like after Al-Qaeda, you had, you know, this, these splintering groups, Boko Haram, uh, this rising ISIS and all. Who now, what happens now as these various terror groups, whether you deem them on the run or not, merge, change, morph into something more sinister? What? Well, we, we don't have top ISIS leadership. We haven't killed or captured top ISIS leadership. We've simply taken territory away. Uh, I recently, recently returned from Mosul, and I'll tell you, the situation there is ripe for security backslide, meaning that ISIS will morph into the al-Qaeda model where they recruit, intimidate, assassinate, conduct attacks, and try to destabilize, uh, re-destabilize northern Iraq and, and Syria. You're still seeing ISIS being able to conduct these attacks. But again, they morph into a, a ISIS 2.0, where they can actually shoot down American aircraft in the future, or they go into the al-Qaeda model, which is the easiest model to survive in, where you simply have cells, you conduct attacks, you recruit, and you plan, and you become very strategic in, in, your, in your operations. All right, Michael, very good seeing you again. Uh, hey, thanks, Michael, Neil, for having me. Or, you know, stocks were up today. Uh, now, a lot of that had to do with the fact that it was relief that this wasn't a whole lot worse. But a lot of it has to do with tax cuts. They're looking like more and more of a sure thing. And that uh, the, the key Senate and House conferees meeting right now can bridge their differences. This, as the President of the United States is playing an address, we are told on Wednesday, to outline what he'd like to see and when he'd like to see it. His final stamp, his final call after this. All right, the president is planning to address the nation about these tax cuts. His closing argument, we're told, on Wednesday, sometime Wednesday afternoon. Uh, that is the same time this uh, conference committee made up of uh, House members and Senate members uh, hashes out their differences, tries to merge a final report, and the hope is uh, get it to the president's desk for signing before Christmas. Uh, Senate Finance Committee member, also a member on this August panel, Pennsylvania Republican Pat Toomey. Senator, very good to have you. Good to be back, Neil. What do you think it looks like for getting it to the president by Christmas? I think it looks pretty good. We, we've got some work to be done yet, but we are working hard on it uh, on the phone all weekend long. And 
back here in Washington, obviously, to try to get this wrapped up. I'm optimistic. Are you worried about this Alabama race, Senator, um, that it, 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 with a Democratic pickup potentially, your margin shrinks all the more, 51-49? Uh, well, that would be true if that's the way it turned out. But uh, look, I, I think we've got a very, very good shot at getting it to the president's desk before a new sw senator is sworn in in any case. Is that the goal? Uh, look, the goal is to get it to the president's desk as soon as we can do it properly. And we think we can do that uh, sometime next week. And so I hope we will. I don't want to get too far afield from this tax discussion. But if Roy Moore wins this race, do you think he should be seated in the United States Senate? I, I don't think we have any choice in that matter, Neil. I think the Constitution is very clear. If he is seated and that is properly authenticated and certified by the officials in Alabama, then I think we're obligated to seat him. Uh, and I think at that point it's probably going to be a matter for the Ethics Committee to investigate the charges against him. All right, even though they would be decades old charges, whether you agree with them or not. That's right. Right, okay. Um, on the tax thing, uh, the, the the, the latest uh, wrinkle seems to be when to implement the, the corporate tax cut, Senator, and uh, whether you're open, in your case, to, to hiking a little bit. I think the Senate has an implementation date of 2019, the House 2018. There is talk of raising the 20 percent, maybe to 22 percent, to win over some of your maybe uh, anxious colleagues uh, in the House and the Senate. W where do you stand? Uh, well, let's go back. Both the House and the Senate have a 20 percent C Corp rate. The difference, as you correctly pointed out, is whether that takes effect on January 1st of 2018 or 12 months later. At the end of the day, we're not that far apart. And both House and Senate conferees share the goal of being at 20 percent if we can possibly do that, and we might be able to do that. Uh, so uh, I'm not I don't think it's a, a matter handed down uh, to Moses as to what the correct date is. I'm open to uh, that discussion. We're having that discussion. But I would point out that in any case, the expensing provision, the provision that allows full deduction for right. capital expenditures, that definitely kicks in on January 1st, 2018, under any scenario. So the, uh, the fact is you might get a bigger boost of economic activity if you delayed the lower corporate rate because then capital expenditure could be deducted against the 35% rate rather than a 20% rate. Either way, the economy is going to respond very positively to what we're doing. Uh, there had been talk as well about increasing uh, the deduction for state and local taxes beyond the $10,000 threshold. How do you feel about that? Well, my own uh, preference is I think it's a bad idea to force low-tax jurisdictions to subsidize people who live in high-tax jurisdictions, and that's what happens when you allow the deductibility of state and local taxes. Having said that, we understand that there are a number of Republicans in high-tax jurisdictions that are concerned about this, so that's an ongoing discussion about where we land on that. You know, all of this, when maybe the more time people have to examine things, you've seen this Wall Street Journal report of a 100-plus percent tax yeah. for some uh, entities, and then you have uh, individuals in some of these aforementioned high-tax states who could end up paying more, maybe significantly more, that uh, when people get a, a wind of this, that they're going to have a little case of sticker shock, and, and uh, it's one of those, be careful what you wish for, you just might get it. What, what do you say? Yeah, there's very, very few people that are going to have a tax increase. Uh, the story about the 100% marginal rate, it's a very, very selective, unusual circumstance, and it would only apply to a small amount of income. And by the way, I hope we can fix that, because that is not a, a desirable feature. But look, the, the basic takeaway is the vast majority of American taxpayers are going to pay less than federal taxes, and we are going to encourage a tremendous wave of new investment and business expansion. Both of those things are really good for the people that I represent. Senator, thank you for taking the time. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Neil. All right, an attempted terror attack near Times Square. How security is getting stepped up ahead of the holiday season, just in case.